Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on Facebook and also on Zoom. My name is Ingrid Jean-Baptiste. I'm the founder and director of the Chelsea Film Festival in New York City that just opened its eighth annual edition last night. And this is a four day event. So please get your passes on Film Festival Plus so you can watch a lot of films. We have a lineup of 130 films from 18 different countries this year. We have a lot of documentaries, feature films, short films that uh, will enlighten your weekend. Please take a look at those um, beautiful work that we have from emerging filmmakers. And today I would like to welcome our two guests, uh, Robin Weigert, who is our special guest today. She is our jury member this year and she's a wonderful actress. Uh, and she will be talking about her career with uh, her friend. Her, his name is Tim Kirkman. I'd like to uh, welcome both of them. They're joining us from Los Angeles this morning. Welcome Robin and Tim. Hi. Um, Hello. Robin has a long list of amazing credits. She is an Emmy nominated actress. She um, was seen in Big Little Lies. You've seen her also in Deadwood in the film Concussion that was uh, selected at the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, also more, most recently in Bombshell. And uh, she began her career in theater. Uh, she will tell us more about her beginnings and also uh, about all the amazing credits that uh, I mentioned today. And Tim is also uh, an Emmy nominated, um, Emmy nominated presenter and also director. Uh, he has won uh, Gotham, he has also been nominated, sorry, uh, Gotham uh, Awards and for his film Loggerheads that he directed and wrote, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and won a top prize at Outfest. And uh, he will moderate the conversation for us this morning. He is also um, a teacher at USC, at UCLA, and the Berman College of Fine Arts. Thank you both of you for coming this morning on this early morning in Los Angeles. And I'll turn it over to you, Kim. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. I see some familiar faces. Um, and it's, I'm really excited to be here with my friend Robin who I had the great good fortune to uh, collaborate with on the movie Loggerheads that Ingrid was just mentioning. And um, I will just start by saying anyone who has the, the fortune to work with Robin understands that um, when you collaborate with her, you're collaborating with someone whose curiosity and intelligence and uh, passion is, is, only matched by um, her deep wells of empathy, which is, I think, the greatest gift that she she brings to um, our our art form that we're working in. And uh, I think it's why she connects with so many audiences on on a, across a range of different projects and platforms, actually, stage, screen, television, streaming. Um, and I'm really happy to be here to talk with her and to to hear from you. So, um, hi, Robin. Hi, Tim. <laughs> Good to see so, you. Yes. How are you Tim. doing? How are you this morning? How are you this morning? Start with that. <laughs> the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a certain seriousness of intent this morning because this is billed as a, as a masterclass and I, I actually want to try to uh, teach something um, as opposed to just chat about my my resume or, or, or anything. I, I, I have um, felt for a long time like uh, acting itself needs a champion um, as an art form. And, and, uh, and so uh, I, I, I'm actually planning to read to you to start with, and I hope it's not too boring, but I'm planning to read to you a, um, a letter 
like a letter, an email that I wrote to uh, a psychotherapist named Mark O'Connell back in uh, uh, on August 31st of 2017. Um, Mark was a fan of Big Little Lies and he was writing a book called The Creative Art of Psychotherapy. And he used to be an actor. He became a psychotherapist and he realized that his acting training was relevant to the work he did as a therapist and he wanted to have a dialogue about that. So he sent me his opening, uh, his introduction and I read it and I uh, very atypically, I, I don't usually do this, but I engaged with him and we worked on his book some together. So I'm gonna read you this email, which I think says a lot about what I feel acting is. Uh, Dear Mark, I read what you sent me with great interest and look forward to talking with you. I'm in the grip of a pretty nasty cold, which I caught on my way home from a job in Canada and wonder if we could schedule a time to talk after it's had a chance to work its way through my system. How's next week for you? I've set down some initial ideas here. First, a little context, colon. <laughs> What I know about psychotherapy, I know from having been in therapy myself and from having grown up the daughter and granddaughter of psychoanalysts. I have read minimally but deeply some of the seminal works of Freud, Jung, etc., as well as a few relevant books of philosophy. My father practiced in Washington, DC. His mother's name was Dr. Edith Weigert. And for a time she ran the Washington Psychoanalytic Institute. She was formidable. Not only did the grandmother I know as Ada cast a long shadow, many of my dad's colleagues had gone through their training analyses with her and had a great deal to say about how they felt she should be cared for in her old age and what kind of son they felt like she deserved. I mentioned how outsized my grandmother's reputation was and how my dad's peers related to him about her because I think these things conspired to make my dad undervalue and underestimate his own considerable talent as a professional listener. Okay, this is where it begins. <laughs> I know he was an excellent practitioner from the testimony at his memorial of some of his former patients, but I, I do not know if he ever saw his practice as an art form. Dad was always deeply enamored of creativity. His mother started a creativity series at the Institute, which my father took over from her after her death. I remember wondering as creative luminaries paraded through our house when I was a kid, fascinating people, Anais Nin, uh, William Gibson, who was the author of uh, Miracle Worker, uh, the inventor of the game Dungeons and Dragons, Gary Gygax. <laughs> Why my father imagined creativity was something to study as a phenomenon rather than a practice or a, sorry, a resource to mine within himself. Like so many people who allow themselves to feel for whatever set of reasons, unremarkable, he fetishized genius. One of the reasons I care so passionately about your subject, one of the reasons I chose to respond to your lovely request to engage with you about your book, even though we are strangers, is that I spent a lot of my childhood wishing my father could have a relationship to the concept of creativity that would allow it to feel less elusive. It seems very important for the mental well being of therapists that they be able to conceive of themselves as creatives, which indeed they are. So they do not imagine they are, as you put it, relegated to the shadows. And I, I linger there in, in reading this to you because um, I was writing this to a stranger, and of course, I'm, I'm repeating it to strangers, but I think it's important in this uh, COVID era to tell the full truth here, which is that my dad was institutionalized five separate times. That's how bad it got for him, uh, mental, mental um, issues. So two kinds of listening, colon. In therapy, as in life, the power of the listener derives from the fact that the speaker does not fully know himself. This power can be a liability unless the listener truly, uh, sorry, unless the listener values presence above presence, sorry, this is important, values presence above his or her own agenda. 
The quality of listening of the therapist is what is most instructive, which is why a minimally interventionist approach can be so galvanizing if the patient feels a kinship with the therapist. The therapist models good listening in order to help inculcate in the patient the ability to better listen to himself. Active intervention on the part of the therapist, though sometimes necessary, as it was for the character I played in Big Little Lies, is always a risk. In the therapeutic context, if the listener judges, then the speaker is taught to bring judgment into his dialogue with himself. At the core of our relationship with ourselves, judgment has no place. Judgment stands in the way of our ability to hear the still voice within, which is the one true barometer of right action. Parents only capable of conditional love harm their children's ability to perceive their own true impulses. A therapist in some sense is charged with reparenting. This is what makes the listening of the therapist so active. There is an aspect of parenting which could best be described as listening the child into his or her own becoming. In acting, listening is an action performed with creative intent. Subjectivity is being invented, not unearthed as it is in a therapeutic session. It is not a given that the self that is the character your scene partner is playing is lurking there beneath well-practiced defenses or waiting to be revealed once the bracken of transference, counter-transference is cleared away. The act of listening within fictional circumstances is an invitation for disbelief to be suspended, yours as well as your scene partners. Uh, here is where I feel I have something to offer you that might be very useful for your book. My experience is both as an actor and as an analysand is that when we listen with creative intent, we invite participation. What it is exactly that comes in to the theater or set or comes into the therapist's office and participates in the scene, in the session is hard to define. Even after so many years acting, I can still only describe the experience as one of being joined. By what exactly, I cannot say. What I can say is that creativity for me is just this, nothing more. Ask, ask this way and ask that way, ask again, wait, receive. Listening as an invitation, colon. <laughs> the patient begins therapy identifying with the aspect of himself that interferes with self-knowledge, which he experiences as a kind of stuckness. The therapist's delicate task is to encourage him to gradually begin to identify with that within himself, which listens and can unstick him. Once the patient begins listening in the manner the therapist has modeled, compassionately, without judgment, but not without sense. There is an immediate, there is not, sorry, an immediate cure. What happens at that point is that the authentic self finds an ally. That ally is an almost mystical element, both extrinsic to and intrinsic to the dyad, neither fully the patient nor fully the therapist. Just as it happens inside of every creative act, Listening has opened a door and the room has been entered. One of the great values of comparing acting to therapy is that in acting, there is a name for this character that steps in when invited, this child that is born of your listening. We call it a character. Important. It is not your character that enters the scene when invited. It is the other actors character. You believe in her character. She has become manifest through your listening. Your belief has sparked belief inside your scene partner. And now that your scene partner believes in herself, she's able to listen your character into existence as well. This can all happen simultaneously, but this is the event and it is utterly reciprocal. It is nice for actors when a film, uh, sorry, a film director or uh, can affirm that was the take. But typically, we knew that already. 
That was the take when it happened. We can feel it. When acting on stage long after the director has moved on to another production, there remains a palpable difference between those nights when we are going through the motions and when we are electrified by a feeling of presence. Again, that word presence is very important. Presence, presence. Getting in deeper now. Three is a very important number when talking about a relationship between two people. The ego fights to keep a relationship of two, a relationship of two. Only when invited does a third element join the conversation and change both the speaker and the listener. Both are transformed into being as less driven by intentionality to produce that which I would manufacture than by receptivity to respond to that which is, to respond to that which is. There is a reason our pathologically narcissistic president wants to relate directly to the people without the mediating third element of the press in the way. He does not want to be shown a version of, him, of himself that he did not produce with conscious intent. For people who are not pathological narcissists, though, the experience of being shown what you have not seen in yourself while humbling can also be liberating. Self-delusion is a cage from which we all secretly want to escape however much mortification we may have to endure before we can achieve a modicum of genuine freedom. I would argue that this radical subjugation of the ego does not happen without participation of a non-manufactured presence that responds to an invitation extended in the form of listening. I listen as non-manipulatively and non-judgmentally as I am able to what I perceive to be within you. If you are feeling stuck and are hungry to become unstuck, your response to being exposed by someone who is doing their best to bear witness will be to deepen your own listening to yourself. Once you have attuned your listening, to this more creative, i.e. receptive frequency, a third element, should we call it presence, enters the room, joins the therapist and the patient and makes transformation possible. I understand why when you briefly reference, sorry how academic this gets for a second, but it's quick. Uh, when you quickly reference, uh, briefly rep reference Jessica Benjamin, you've, you, you've chosen to leave out her concept of thirdness as you contrast complementarity and mutual recognition. We don't have easy to digest secular language for a third element participating in a dyad, and you are not trying to write an academic paper. You are not trying to put yourself in a lineage with Lacan and Derrida and Foucault. You're trying to speak to therapists in a practical way about how they might employ acting method as you have to enhance the therapeutic experience. I still think it might be useful to embrace the challenge of bringing some version of the concept of a mitigating third element into the conversation, whatever clear diction you can find in your introduction, uh, though, because Without it, I see you hitting a potential snag down the road. Even if the logic is purely transitive, I think getting the idea of a third thing in there as early as the intro would be super useful to you down the road. At the moment, you're introdu you introduce your readers to pairs of concepts that contrast with each other and then invite them to read your book with the promise that acting training has provided you with the tools you can communicate that help you navigate being in two opposite conditions at once. You contrast hiding in the shadows with performing, improvising with memorizing, self-promotion with caring for others. What you're ultimately hoping to offer, though, it seems to me, and sorry, this is where I can slow down because I know that that was all gobbledygook to you. What, what you're, uh, what you're uh, ultimately hoping to offer, though, it seems to me, is more than a set of tools that might help therapists reconcile seeming opposites. Most practicing therapists will have tools in their toolbox to help them navigate that terrain already. What, you're, what your premise suggests you are proposing is that therapy can be elevated to the level of art and that allowing it to be an art form can enhance your awareness of and participation in its transformational power. I don't know how you'll be able to build that case without at least alluding to the mysterious element that poets and painters of old used to call the muse. Okay, there was a word for this once. I want to paint a painting. I look at the blank canvas. I wait and extend an invitation. Then it comes. Something comes and I can begin. What it is that, what is it that enters when invited? 
we who are in the arts don't really know intellectually. We just know that it does. I'm almost done. Therapists have trod and retrod this ground before. Id, ego, superego is a conceptual triad, complementarity, mutual recognition, and thirdness. Thirdness in Benjamin's relational iteration of that is, is, is her relational iteration of that triad. Still, if I try to imagine what you or I as actors might uniquely have to bring to therapists' understanding of the galvanic potential of their work, it would be that, ex that experience we have of needing to open to possibility and then be receptive to being joined by something both intrinsic to and extrinsic to ourselves, which we call character. Actors tend to conceive of their process as a process of creation, while therapists tend to conceive of their process as a process of excavation. If therapists were more attuned to the sensation, the sensation of being joined in their work, okay, because it's a feeling you get when your character arrives, sensation of being joined in their work, it might help them conceive of their work differently. It might help infuse their work with a greater sense of joy and fulfillment. And then I say, which is true, a long-winded email I know. I hope what I'm saying makes sense. Look forward to speaking with you soon. Best wishes and thanks for including me in your process. Warmly, Robin. So that is the basis of the conversation I would like to have. I know it went on a bit, but here we go. Robin, that was extraordinary. <laughs> um, a, a few impressions kind of jumped out at me that I'd like to kind of start the conversation with. Um, the first is, um, I think you're a, a teacher. So I'm glad that you had the impulse to teach today because I think- Called a master class. <laughs> it is a master class and that's, I'm, I love that that's what we're, we're kicking this off with because it's, it's, um, it's relate, not unrelated, I think to some of the things that you're talking about in terms of uh, performance and, and psychotherapy. And one of, one of the first things I tell my students who, are, who want to be directors is to, to do two things, to act, to, f to learn what that feels like, what that experience is like for actors and to get some therapy. <laughs> yes. Those are the two things. Those are the two things. Whether you think you need it or not, to do it because it will help you understand the human experience, why people make their choices and who they become and how you become you and all that. Um, but I want to start with one little phrase that really jumped out at me. And if you could talk a little bit about that and how it relates to, well, whatever, but the work perhaps, sure. um, I mean, or if, if that's where we want to start, but yeah. it feels like this is very important. in when I teach writing and directing, and it's this, this sentence jumped out the, uh, for me judgment stands in the way of the still voice within. Can you talk a little bit about judgment and how it relates to your approach to characters and how it relates to whatever you're talking, you know, what, whatever this need is for this third thing maybe in the room. Third thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, w one, of the, one of the reasons why creativity is so stymied in the culture right now, I think, is that we're sort of drowning in judgment. Um, you know, we've we've been infused with a, a kind of divisive rhetoric um, that uh, uh, is very censorious and makes it difficult to to have honest dialogue. And so it also then interferes with um, with creativity for people. And 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 not surprisingly, it leads to depression. You know, widespread. Um, uh, the symptoms and uh, problems. Above and beyond what's caused by this pandemic, I think people are traumatized by the political climate that we're in right now. Uh, and, and I think that has reduced people's ability to, um, to be able to manage or handle the challenges of the pandemic. You know? um, so uh, this uh, refinement in our listening um, uh, which is both needed for creativity and for mental health, and I associate them with each other, which is why this is so sort of back and forth and back and forth, um, has to do with uh, clearing away what I think is, a, in most of us, starts with a parental voice that says, nope, you know, bad, uh, that was wrong. Uh, and, um, and that voice starts to be us talking to ourselves, right? We say, no, 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 and begin to shut things down. And we judge ourselves 
um, and there is that within us which we should, you know, restrain when we're in public, you know, out of politeness or or, or wish to take care of one another. Uh, uh, but in terms of the integrity of our relationship with ourselves, we still need to acknowledge it. And um, so, if I were to be playing a character who was clearly dastardly, you know, um, a quote unquote terrible person, uh, as uh, one of my colleagues was. Uh, dealing with last night, having to play a character who was a Karen, okay? Uh, this, is, this is hard work, uh, very hard work and challenging to the, to the soul, to the spirit. Uh, that doesn't mean it's, mean it's not important work, but it's very, very difficult work and it's not surprising it takes an emotional toll um, or serious emotional toll. So let me just say that. But, um, but you have to begin somehow by embracing this person. Uh, you know, if it was Lady M or any other character, you have to begin by finding your way and without judgment, or else you can't embody this uh, this character. Uh, and let the others judge. You know, you have to suspend all of that in order to to engage your character. And there are I mean, most characters we play, we'd have some judgments on. I, I mean, I remember being I did a play uh, in Central Park um, that Mike Nichols directed, who's just I, I what a glorious man he was, but. Um, Marsha Gay Harden was playing a character that I kind of shared with her, which was Masha in uh, Amazing Production of the Seagull. Um, and she did not like Masha, you know? Um, and, uh, and it was so interesting because it, it was like, she's a brilliant, brilliant actress, but she had a lot of uh, climbing to do. She's like, she takes snuff, well, she's depressed all the time, she's, you know, the, like this. And, and it, was, it was heavy lifting for her. It was just hard, you know? And so, when I had this glorious two nights of being able to enter the enter the role, because I got I, I was guaranteed in my contract that I would get to go on for her a couple of times and act with Meryl Streep and all these things, it was just a dream of a job. But um, uh, but I made sure I focused on that aspect of Masha that I could love, and I could particularly love it because the object of Masha's affection was played by Philip Seymour Hoffman in that, and I loved him to the bottom of my soul. I loved him so much. Um, funnily enough, sorry, I'm label because I haven't slept very well, but um, Phil, I accidentally said, the last thing I said to him by accident was, I love you. And his face turned sort of crimson and he said, I love you back. And I'm very happy I made that mistake, that social mistake, you know, because we didn't really know each other well enough for me to say that. But anyway, he played my love interest in that for two nights. And I just focused all of my attention on that sensation I know so well of being in love, you know, being in love. Yeah, she's got a million problems. She's she's a sour puss and a depressive and a da -ba -da -ba -da, you know, and what an unpleasant. But it was entirely for me about what happens when you're just in love with someone who doesn't love you back and never will. You know, that was a thing I could love about her and identify with in her, in that character. And it opened it for me, you know. I, and, and this is not by way of contrast with uh, Masha, who was uh, Marsha Gay Harden, rather, who was, who was great, um, but just needed to find her way there in a process that's called more outside in, you know, using um, physical cues to kind of get you into the character, which is another way to get into character. Um, I prefer, if I can, to start with identifying, you know, with the character. But as with Calamity Jane, for example, she's so different, as you can see from how I present, that I, that I had to, I and mean, she's very much me somewhere inside myself, but very different from how I present. I had to find her um, in that outside in way. You know, I looked at pictures and um, um, had to dress myself up, I mean, in a full on costume and everything just to kind of like, find her and then I had to find a voice and all, all the, and then I began to feel the work happening on the inside. Um, so uh, it's either or and neither is better than the other, but uh, long winded answer again, but there it is. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where to go. No, I'm, I, I, I'm, you know, that's an interesting segue to, I think, the idea of the professional listener also struck me um, because I feel like one of the things that I, I love to watch is a, a 
character in a story listening to another character. I so prefer being on the person listening in a film, for example, than the person talking. Obviously in theater, that's a little diff different situation. But in, and when I'm thinking about film and television, and there's this tendency sometimes to go back and forth on whoever's talking, you know, to cut on these yeah. lines. And it just, it's like, I'm allergic to that now. And yeah. I think it has, there's a deep connection to what you're talking about in terms of um, what's going on behind the eyes when someone listens is very different from the, th from the moment when they're talking. <laughs> you know? Totally. And, you know, Jean-Marc Vallée was a very intuitive director on Big Little Lies. Um, some of those scenes were, were um, you know, the therapist scenes were um, clearly specified in, in the script, you know, for example, when I'm really boring into to Nicole at one point, uh, uh, it, it was written in the script, um, you know, that the camera, I mean, that was meant to be boring into her at the same time. And he just didn't do it that way in the edit. He, he, he to my great surprise, stayed on me doing the boring into, you know, even though I'm not an A-list actor and not the um, point in a way, not the point of the scene, uh, you know, and, um, I'm, I'm very grateful to that edit um, and to him for being um, kind of um, uh, an intuitive animal like that. You know, he, he's, he's a wonderful, interesting director who, who um, um, something kind of feline about him, you know, just uh, uh, present for everything, feeling it. W would not be surprising to have him come out from behind the monitor with tears in his eyes, uh, you know, having let himself be moved by a take uh, and uh, really in it. And we were very much in pursuit of the real there, almost dogma style. I mean, it was like a, a few takes, it, was, it felt like anything could happen, literally including abandoning the lines altogether and Nicole just splitting because uh, the therapist had transgressed. You know, It's very delicate um, with a patient in that kind of condition, like you can trigger fight or flight you know, response very, very easily if you come at them too strongly. And that was a tremendous kind of uh, aid to my work because it was like a kind of truth serum. Um, keep saying that truth serum these days, but yeah, it was kind of like um, there was just no avoiding being in the true moment. And I also think there's an interesting dynamic. Uh, I'm not intimidated by uh, A-list uh, people, but a lot of people are, you know? So there's something actually sort of brazen about a dynamic where I, I was sort of genuinely curious about her. And I don't mean to conflate actor and character uh, at all, because that's very unfair and people do it way too much. But I could feel that there was whatever it was, mysterious it was, real content in the room there, especially season one. Like there was something in the room with us that felt very, the texture of the real was with us. That's all I can say. Maybe we want to talk about this as that third element, but I absolutely 100% believed her. And this is, this is a good example of what I was trying to say in that sort of essay, a letter. I 100% believed her. And I think that the gift that that may have given her is that she could then believe me, you know? Uh, I, I had no question that something real was with us. Uh, and um, and I, I had read or heard or whatever that she might have uh, been judgmental of her most excellent work before really seeing it uh, back. Um, and I just think that's because of the kind of space we were in. It was very vulnerable. Um, and why wouldn't one want to judge where one isn't holding the reins and feeling like they could do as they, you know, used to being a very, very adept actress and like being able to take it this way and that way and, and do anything she chooses and having so much under her belt. You know, she, she may have been in a zone, you know, I don't want to be presumptuous with this, but where that facility was feeling a little like, you know, um, which made that work so beautiful to me. God, was she beautiful in that. Um, and uh, and then we were in bomb, bombshell together, uh, paired together again in such a different scenario. And there was much more, um, you know, craft on both of our parts, uh, which is not a disparaging. I don't use the word disparagingly, you know, but 
Um, but what that meant was we could chat between scenes, which was nice because I actually got to know her a bit on that one more. You know, we couldn't chat between scenes on Big Little Lies. Like uh, in between takes, I mean, in between every, first of all, she would only arrive right, right as the scene was to begin. So there was no preamble. It was like she would walk in and she was Celeste. There was no, and then like, if we needed to do a new camera blah, 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 and, and Jean-Marc would like go into sort of like his French Canadian French with his shorthand with his uh, DP, you know, and that guy would be like on the ground doing an angle like this. And it was fantastic, but they were in their own literally vocabulary because of French uh, and their own shorthand lingo. And we in the scene, so we're not hearing the directions uh, or at least I can't speak French well enough to understand, um, you know, we're locked in still. And she might be pacing with those incredible sort of glacial blue eyes, just keeping the tension going. And I was just sort of having to house that energy that was coming from her, you know, and that was great for both of us. So anyway. But it sounds like in that scenario, the one that you just described with Nicole yeah. Kidman, yeah. that you, that there was something else going on that you were given or a space was created a space where that was that, allowed it, yes. to happen. Do you yes. know what I mean? That it, that it has, it, it's what you, you have and what she has, but if this third thing hadn't been there to allow for that. Well, and let's not forget, because it's also what you do so well too, is it, that the director needs to allow that to happen. You know, um, And one of the gifts of working with you as a director is that you create this space, you create this permission, you, you direct so sensitively and with such an attunement to the experience of the actors, and it and it shows in the in the in the product as well. You know that the performances are so um, human and exposed, and it's because you make it safe. So stop, 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 stop. <laughs> please stop. So, but safety is key. It's very as, kind of you. As, as a gift from a director. I mean, safety is maybe the biggest thing a director can give. And I know some of your students are in the audience. Um, mm -hmm. If I were in your classroom, I would be saying um, to them this about, and I think you said this to me at one point about teaching them um, safety for an actor, as safe as you can make it for them because they're taking enormous, enormous risks. Um, no matter how light the material may seem to be, exposing ourselves in front of other people is, is um, is a risk and a gift, and but it's a risk, and remember to honor that. You know, um, uh, I do talk about that. It's in, in yeah. how the actor is so, sometimes, literally and always figuratively naked. Um, and in the case of, I mean, a character like Jane, or or <laughs> your character in Concussion, you know, both of they couldn't be yeah. more different, and yet, I think both of them have been naked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, and I, I, I popped my cherry on Deadwood and it was in the most unflattering freaking scene, man. You know, it's like she takes a bath and I've got like these underarm merkins going with like, you know, uh, added hair. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, but and that was the hardest scene, not surprisingly, to loop when there needed to be some looping. Um, you know, which is to put, uh, for those who don't know, uh, put your voice in after the fact, you know, put in speaker, because I, I, I had trouble recreating the state of being in my body in that first vulnerable nude scene I'd ever done, you know. And then in the concussion, you know, rem remembering how that had felt, I did myself the favor, and it was purely for the sake of my acting, not my vanity, that's not entirely true. But I, I got in some good shape before that one, because I thought if I'm distracted by my by my body, uh, I won't be able to function in this as a prostitute, you know? So, uh, so, you know, I'll be thinking as I'm sitting on the edge of the bed, is my pooch showing, you know, or my stomach pooching? And, you know, like I didn't want any thoughts of self. If anything, I wanted it to feel like she was less of a prostitute because she was a prostitute for women than more like a gigolo because a gigolo has a very different job than a prostitute does. A prostitute shows up and lies down and is an object and, you know, but a gigolo needs to make the woman feel comfortable and attractive, need, you know, needs to, to do that. So anyway, oh, it looks like we're on to something else. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. We have a lot of questions for you. Oh, okay. So I think Let's we want to open it up. We yeah. want to open it up to yeah. some questions. Uh, Ingrid, do you see some? Yeah, that might... sure. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Julia. She's asking, I'm an aspiring actress and I'm also a writer. So I keep hearing, turn off your writer brain. Do you have any suggestions? Oh, I really, really do. Yeah. I mean, I think um, David Milch was a wonderful, wonderful teacher of writing and I had the great good fortune of being, you know, in his care for some years. And so some stuff sunk in that he said on this. What he recommended first to writers is to do um, every day, uh, just sit down and let, you know, sort of like character one, uh, talk with character two and just write. Uh, you don't know where they are at first. You don't know, you know, just, you just, you just write. And then you take these dialogues and you stick them in a drawer. You know, and you don't look back. You don't look at them. You're, what you're trying to do is get around. Same thing for an actor. Get around that judgment. You know, that judgment is not your friend. Uh, now, for me, because I'm an actor, when I try writing, um, I need I need to have that sensation that the character is kind of talking to me, and then I sort of take dictation. You know, that's not the way everybody is going to come at writing. It's just I think maybe an actor's way of coming at writing. You know, I. I start to hear it, I sort of hear the cadences, I hear the character come their voice and then I try to write them, which means I overwrite like crazy when I'm writing screenplays because it's like, there's so much dialogue, you know, you, you're supposed to, it's, it's meant to be a visual medium and I just go blah, 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 because I enjoy that. But um, so my advice to writers would, and I'm trying to co commute this a David Milch message, is just to find any end run you can around judgment, around your judgment of yourself in the process. And for each person, it might be different, but those morning pages sound like a really good idea. Olenka Flores is asking, how did your desire for acting come about? That's a good one. Uh, I didn't respect it at first. I didn't think it's something a serious person uh, uh, could do. And as you can probably tell from um, you know me unadorned here, I, I came from a pretty intellectual uh, background um, and it felt like I was meant to do something else, maybe become a therapist or maybe uh, you know uh, an academic or what have you. And, and but uh, callings are what callings are, you know, and I, I uh, it's like there's one thing that you're like, well, I'm, I'm clearly built to do this. And there's another thing where I was in love, you know, and sometimes you're in love with a terrible person for you. <laughs> but being in love is just being in love, right? Like, like when we fall in love, we can do it in a disastrous way, which I kind of feel like this was. Like, I kind of feel like it's a disaster that I was in love with acting. Like a disaster with this way it's gone now in the culture. Like I'm supposed to manufacture a, a, a persona, a, 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 a virtual person in, in, in internet space to kind of make myself attractive to casting directors and sort of have public political opinions and talk about my sexuality. And like, it's a freaking nightmare out there. You know, like why am I even the subject at all of the conversation. It's what I do. You know, acting is an art form. I mean, you know, I'm trying to say anything here. It's that acting is a freaking art form. It's not like, oh, good, let's like plug that person in because they are that. And let's plug this other person in because they are that. And boy, that character is like who I now know that actor to be. It's so boring. And it's not sacred. And it is a sacred art. It's not, it's not sacred. It's but that's about bodies. And this is not about bodies. This, if anything I'm saying, it's not about bodies. It has to do with something we're very tentative to talk about on the left, especially, which is spirit. You know, uh, they have so much vocabulary on the right about, you know, God, God, God. They don't use it well, but they, they use it easily. But uh, on the left, we're very ginger about it because we feel like it's either science or it's God or it's... And then people in LA who are into spirituality are like flakes, you know? So you can't talk about spirituality because then you're gonna be one of those actors. It's like, oh, listen to her go on about the spirit or whatever. But there's a fact here, which is that there's something mysterious going on and it is quite sacred. It's quite sacred and... Uh, the reason I'm doing this like this, which is such an unconventional way to do it, is that it needs 
a champion. Nobody is talking about it. Maybe Meryl Streep has talked about it when she calls this the art of compassion. You know, she, she obviously through her work, she obviously gets it, right? And in some ways she's like the patron saint of, you know, like we all don't want to admit it, but we slightly worship her. But what we're worshiping isn't um, the vessel that is Meryl Streep, it's what's coming through her with these myriad characters that just come through her and through her and through her. It's that miracle that we're actually worshiping and we shouldn't worship like idolatry, but we should respect that it's an art form, you know, like being a painter is an art form or anything else. It's been so denigrated. Um, and I'm meant to show up, I'm, I'm sorry, I felt like I wasn't respectful of enough of the question about, you know, what it was like to be a woman in an empowered situation with other women on Big Little Lies. It's like, I'm, I'm interested-ish to talk about that. You know, I'm somewhat interested to talk about that, but I'm much more interested to talk not about me as a woman or me as anything, but about character, you know? Um, because it's, it's, it's character that's suffering in all of this. Um, and I believe in, in um, everybody having a voice, but there is a liability in identity politics, which is that identity is first and foremost. And the beauty of acting is it obliterates identity. You know, it's me allowing something to come through me to you. And it's meant to be a gift to you for your own growth as a human, you know, for your compassion, for your wonderment. It's maybe you can compare it to like a beautiful magic trick, but for, for things that are meant to open you to you, not to me, you know, open you to yourself, not, oh, curiosity about her, who she's sleeping with. Fuck that. I'm sorry. But like, you know, like that, that's not interesting to me. And the culture is obsessed with it because they want to be able to rip people to shreds, you know, really. It's brutal. And, uh, you know, you sign up to be a thing that you're, that you're designated and then you sign up to be a role model. And there's no greater curse, as Ellen DeGeneres has discovered, than being a role model. Because you stand on this pedestal only to be ripped down and destroyed when it suits people to do so. You know, uh, no fun being a role model. So why do people sign up to do it? Uh, uh, and it's not what acting is, so. Serena, Ryan, and Ethan Ixo, um, they're actually our um, guest filmmakers this year. And they're asking, how have you film simultaneously protected your most vulnerable parts of your artistry while growing a thick enough skin to handle the hard, cruel aspects of the industry, which you just talked about, I guess. <laughs> that's a good one, though. That's a, a thank that's you. a great question. Oh that's my awesome. gosh, it's an awesome question because it is a total paradox, which is that we have to be these warriors, you know, and we have to be completely available and vulnerable um, at the same time. Um, but, you know, I mean, not to be grandiose about what acting is, but, you know, if you were, you might as well ask that question of a, a priest in a war-torn country, you know, like, if you embrace it as a, uh, I want to say, holy undertaking, then you have a reason to do it, and it's humiliating. It's I'm humiliated all the time. I felt so humiliated last night. I see it's humiliating all the time to, especially red carpets are, are, are my least favorite thing. Um, Cause you have to sort of like stand and pose and pretend in this way that I find so offensive. I can't even explain why it's like, you know one of my favorite things about lockdown was it was just like goodbye to gowns. You know, I remember somebody coming coming up uh, on a red carpet after Deadwood and I got an Emmy nomination and she, and she was like, oh, you're, you're, so, you're so pretty in real life, you know, like this. And I went, real life? This is me being totally candid on a red carpet. I was like, it took six hours to do this, <laughs> you know? It's not real, <laughs> this is not my real life, you know? Like, like <laughs> that was my actual response because I have no ability to play this game, um, which is probably why I'm not, 
any more successful than I am. I just don't, I hate it. So my answer is probably different from other people's answers, but um, you know, I mean, just the few pictures I put up online in obeisance to the kind of demand that we self promote in this way of like, look at me in this pretty dress. I, I felt covered with ick about it ever since, but there they are, you know, um, the pictures other people put up, that's fine. But the ones I put up myself, like, look at me, you know, I feel so whored out by that stuff. Um, and I know it's part of it, but I hate it. So anyway. Um, another guest filmmaker, his name is Wendell Lawrence, and yeah. he's saying, I was taken with the idea you presented that a person's scene partner listens that person's character into being and vice versa. Could you please speak a little bit more about that? Well, I gave an example of it because it was such an arresting one for me to be inside of uh, with the Nicole Kidman dynamic between, uh, you know, me and her in that, in that space, which was like a wonder to me. I, I remember coming home from those days of work just um, in a state of wonderment that that was possible. Uh, but, um, and it doesn't always happen. There was, a, there was a scene because the second season got rewritten so many times and things. But there was a scene, a couples therapy scene with um, Reese and Adam that left, um, but was one of my favorites. And it left because it couldn't be there for the plot because the plot changed, you know. But I had been given those lines with no time to learn them, which is terrible for me. Like I, I take a long time to learn lines. And so I almost had to sort of just say a prayer over the script and go. And like while it was on their, on their coverage, you know, um, I had the script in my hands. And then when it turned around on me, I had to let it go. And what this forced me to do was be so, 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 so present because otherwise I was gonna lose my lines uh, and listen and just actually try to respond and hope the words would come to me. And because it was a terrifying and forced situation like that and I, um, I was just in love with what happened that day. And there was, was one where I came home and I wish I could just even see it, you know? Uh, but I was like, this, that may have been one of the most extraordinary experiences I've ever had as an actor just there. Uh, because there was no net and I was utterly dependent on this thing of listening and believing their belief in me. It was the only thing that was holding me in place, you know? Um, and without it, I knew I was sunk in that worst actor's nightmare sort of way, sunk, you know, like on stage with no script, that actor's nightmare, you know? And um, all I know is that they were actually listening to me so I could actually incarnate her. I can't really speak about it in a, in a, in a better way than that. I don't know, yeah. We have a question coming from Facebook. Uh, when keeping judgment out of the work, how do you know if you're on the right path with your character? I, th I think I mentioned in the, in the letter as well, there's a sensation that's a bit ineffable of being joined uh, that I, I don't really know how to describe. It's like, oh, something is participating now. And it certainly doesn't happen every time, but it's the hoped for thing. And you just start to feel like, oh, I'm thinking the character's thoughts. I'm feeling the character's feelings. This is right. But it's kind of like you're, you're discovering it from, in, from, from inside. And it's why you can go outside in or inside out or either way to get to the character. Like you can just try to put on a hat and see how it feels or put on a voice and see how it, how it feels. Um, I mean, I would probably have an easier time being the intellectual that I am if I happen to have a British accent. Um, in other words, this character might emerge more often if I happen to have a British accent because um, they, they nuance their, their uh, way of speaking. There's more music to, to it. So you can communicate more complex ideas more complexly. We speak uh, more like this here. Uh, so anything can be a way to sort of trick it open, but um, you know, it can be a sound, it can be a picture, it can be whatever, but you're waiting for that feeling. You're not waiting to know, you're waiting to know, if you know what I mean, like you're waiting to know. And I'm hitting my chest. I want you to know this is on my chest. Do it. 
do it, do it, do it. Um, I wore this. Yeah, for I don't know, Rob. No, it's I don't know. below the level of the camera, but um, do it, please, God, do it. Um, so anyway, yes. <laughs> Actually, we have a question from Emily. Uh, can you cite some literature from the psychoanalysts? I was fascinated by your letter. Being the daughter of two psychoanalysts in Hollywood, I am interested in your insight. Oh, you want me to give liter literature references? Well, what's so beautiful here in this office, sorry, I'm in my PJs, but this is my, <laughs> this is my grandmother's like Freud collection here. Oh. That, but actually this is, this is the, artifact here like the, and what's great is when I go through here sometimes uh, I'll find and here's an example I'll find her like underlinings of things like and and they're little gifts because I I get to see how she related to it it's not like I'm exhaustively reading Freud all the time but like I'll come I'll come to it as a way of like trying to um, uh, you know see what my grandmother was all about and I might find this for example it says um, link between dreams and life is underlined. And then underlined below it is, uh, we only start dreaming of the things that have most struck us during the day uh, after they uh, have lost the spice of actuality in waking life. It's a great sentence. We only start dreaming of the things we have most, that have most struck us during the day after they have lost the spice of actuality in waking life. And then I can just sit there with that. And it's like reading a poem. And I can say like, wow, you know, uh, that's amazing. Uh, and that's kind of how I relate to it. You know, it's not like I'm um, sitting with books, uh, you know, I know I flashed a bunch of names out there like Derrida and Foucault. It's just because my friends who are academics, I know what they're into. Uh, and I know what academia is into. And I know like that. Um, and I also know the BS that's in that world too. There's BS in every world, right? There's BS in the acting world and there's BS in the academic world too. So I try to relate to these, these kind of things, these books, these precious things, um, kind of in the same way I might relate to character. It's like I'm finding for the thing that just drops into my heart or into my mind and I wanna think about it or sit with it for a while. I guess, you know, we're all such different beings, but um, if you haven't tried it, I'd recommend trying that way. You know, opening a book to a random page and seeing what resonates with you and then sitting with that for a while, as opposed to reading a book, so. Thank you, Robin. We're almost out of time, but I'd like you to pick a question. There's so many questions in the <laughs> chat. Um, so if you don't mind deciding which one you want to answer. <laughs> oh, wow, oh God, okay. I don't mean to insult anybody by choosing somebody else's. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm supposed to look at the chat myself here. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm technologically challenged. How do I let's chat? Uh, oh, it appeared and then disappeared. Okay. Uh, something is in Spanish. I wish I spoke it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a. Um... What am I? Oh, okay. Let's see. Stay grounded yet adapt. Uh, difficult situation. That's a great I question. Think, I think we did That's that. That's the one. one I was going to pick. <laughs> oh, oh, well then. No, we check it out. Like that? Okay. Look at uh, that. Check it out. Okay. I'm checking it out. I'm checking it out. Good question. Good question. How do you stay grounded yet adapt quickly in different situations as an actor, such as time difficult. constraints? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Difficult situations. Yeah. Oh, difficult. Sorry. Um, yeah. COVID brain. Uh, I don't have it. I'm just saying, like, these times make my brain fuzzy. Uh, complicated blocking changes or other issues that require speed and can throw off a less experienced actor. Okay. Oh my God, this is actually a, big, a bigger question than you think. Can I add uh, something to it, Robin? Yeah, you, please, said, yeah. you said yeah. something about um, you were working without a net. And I feel like there's, you know, in that scene with Big Little Lies, and it feels like that's- That, you're there's, right. There's Hear a relationship there. here. You're right, you're right, you're right. Because, because the fact is that, and you learn this especially with David Milch, my God, uh, who would sometimes turn, you know, be writing the script out loud and the script supervisor would be writing down the lines and then you would do the scene, you know, like no time to memorize. So, and it's terrifying and also exhilarating because you just by any way possibly just drop in, right? So um, these are all challenges. I'm looking at the, at the litany of things you've put here, time constraints, complicated blocking changes. One of my sadder moments with Jean-Marc is he needed me to do what's called banana 
banana in a, in a, in a take. And I just couldn't, uh, I just couldn't be her and keep all the life going and do this for the camera, this banana move. Um, so I was failing at it and he got frustrated. He got frustrated me. Uh, and I remember him coming at me like this, you know, he's just very, you know, what are you doing? You know, like I had effed it up enough that he came at me with this French thing that terrifies me, um, you know, and, 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 it, and, it, and it rattled me. But, but then what was so interesting is that being rattled happened, or maybe it, nothing is an accident, to uh, also be a way that the therapist was um, feeling at that moment, because she'd really messed up with uh, the patient. Um, and the banana was required because the patient was kind of leaving on her. You know, I, I can't remember if that scene was still in or not, but you know, uh, abandoning the session. So I simply, and I guess I had no choice, but I simply used it uh, for the character. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, I'm like a child when I'm working. So every bit of, um, you know, parental aggression that I might feel from a director uh, goes right to my heart, you know, like it just, it goes just right to my heart. But sometimes it's actually very useful. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes directors exploit that, like they really beat up actors to get a, especially children, actual children, to get an emotional result in the scene, which I, I don't think is a good thing to do. Um, you know, uh, I, I love Suzanne Beer. Uh, I, I did a Suzanne Beer a film, but what I do remember not liking was the way she worked with the child in the, in the thing who was a, a hellion. But I just do remember thinking like, boy, all that could do would be to shut him down. You know, like, like, what are you doing? You know, like, like, but he, you know, he was also like hitting uh, um, Halle Berry, you know, like hitting, like th weird things were happening. And it was like, no, you don't hit your mother. And this weird sort of need to restrain. And anyway, I'm probably telling tales out of school that I shouldn't, but, but like, you know, um, uh, it's important to remember that your actors, if you're a director, are coming from their child place, you know, uh, and we all have that coming from the child aspect of themselves always with all the attendant vulnerabilities and insecurities and um, unformed uh, aspects. Um, you know, I think the character of Calamity Jane for me came from me at about age 12. Uh, you know, a very young version of me was infusing that character. And for good reason, because that's probably about when the character Jane was probably first violated or something like like that character clearly had been through some abuse probably sexual as well as other and might have been arrested by that you know at a certain stage of her growing up and i loved that david wrote in a scene where she was playing duck 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 goose with the with the kids because that's that's how old she actually is so there's all those little kids around her and she was in her happy place because that is actually the age she is inside i think um and that character touched me so much. Uh, you know, what she has to go through. Um, anyway, so it's like the answer really is you don't, you don't necessarily do, do it well. There's no like slick answer like, oh, I have a thing where I do this. It's hard. <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, Robin, for offering us this hour, this really valuable and so meaningful hour with you. Um, it was very powerful. Thank you for this beautiful energy to start the day. And um, you can actually meet Robin again tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we have another talk, uh, not a masterclass, but a panel uh, with uh, Robin and another jury member, Heather Ray, uh, that will talk about um, the current uh, circumstances, circumstances, I'm sorry, of acting uh, in this uh, world that we're living in right now during the pandemic. So uh, please join us tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. The event is called The Real Magic Hour. You can uh, look at our website to register 
on so it's at www.chelseafilm.org and uh, thank you tim for moderating this session i hope to meet you both in person one day when we're out of this zoom world maybe one day this will happen <laughs> And uh, I wish you both a great day. Thank you to our audience members. Thank you uh, to all of you on Facebook Live for joining us. And I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thank, thank you. you.